Are you a gun dealer? It's gonna be kind of important if you wanna stay out of prison and avoid massive fines to understand the answer to this question. Because rest assured, the ATF, the FBI, and Lord knows whoever else is gonna be taking a close look at folks soon as part of President Biden's gun control push. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about what are some of the canonical categories? What are the different types of factors that courts have looked at, as well as some helpful FAQ that the ATF has put out there. We're gonna walk through them all right here. So guys, Guys, let's get into it. So this is going to be so incredibly important to figure out because what we're going to be seeing coming up here, both past as well as present and future, is we're going to see some reimagination and some reinterpretation of some of the rules and interpretations of the phrases concerning who is a firearms dealer, when are you allowed to sell a firearm, even private background checks, and when can that be for profit or not. And guys, I realize that sounds crazy, but welcome to 2023 and beyond. So what we're going to be going through here is some of the provisions that we have seen introduced initially in the 1968 Gun Control Act, which of course created the dealer licensing system that we're dealing with today. Of course, if you're a hobbyist, and we're gonna be getting to all these definitions in this video, so stick around. If you are a hobbyist, you do not need to get an FFL, a federal firearms license in order to sell firearms. If you are a gun dealer, we're gonna be talking about what that is here, then you do need to get a federal firearms license to sell firearms. And by the way, if you get this wrong, you're looking at up to five years in prison and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. So this is something that you probably cannot afford to get wrong. And importantly, the definitions might be changing coming up with the president's advice and suggestion to Attorney General Merrick Garland asking that he quote unquote clarify the status of statutory law concerning when is somebody a firearms dealer. So let's take a look at some of the classifications in courts. How have courts looked and treated this topic? But we're only going to do this briefly. And then we're going to push into some ATF FAQ sections with some examples that the ATF themselves has provided shortly after that. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at this. Whether you represent yourself as a dealer in firearms, what does this mean? Number one, are you telling people that you are a dealer of firearms? Are you handing out business cards, shirts, all that kind of stuff to indicate that, look, this is something that I absolutely do. I'm a dealer and I'm representing myself as such. Are you using dealer and retail vocabulary like restocking, inventory, making advertisements? Those are kind of business sort of things. And again, none of this is to say that these are canonical, all-encompassing categories, but we're trying to describe what would differentiate between a hobbyist and someone who's in the business, if the ATF or someone's gonna be trying to put together a case against you down the lens, saying that, look, you are a business dealer. Another factor the courts will look at is whether you are repetitively buying and selling firearms. So a hobbyist in the views of the government makes occasional sales to build their collection. A dealer in the views of the government, again, I'm only the messenger here, folks, don't come after me, is somebody who's repetitively engaged in sales. So we're talking about both the volume of firearms in a sale. So whether or not if you sell a, if you do one transaction with someone at a gun show and it's for three guns, 10 guns or 20 guns, uh, and whether or not, of course, number two is not only the volume involved in an individual sale, but also, of course, the number of times that you're selling firearms. After all, a hobbyist may be involved Again, I'm only the messenger here, folks. The government would argue that a hobbyist is only gonna be involved in sales maybe periodically and occasionally throughout the year. Someone who is dealing in firearms, in other words, they're in the business and require licensing, according to the government, is gonna be someone who's maybe doing it on a weekly, daily, or perhaps monthly basis. I think ultimately the courts are gonna unfortunately have to step in on this. And again, I'm not saying that in a cheerleading way. I just think that, frankly, they're gonna get really aggressive on where that line goes. Another factor the courts will consider is the circumstances under which you are selling those firearms. Are you selling them shortly after acquiring them? So in other words, are you purchasing them on Monday, selling them on a Tuesday or the following week? Because everybody understands that you're gonna buy something and maybe it's not for you or you don't use it and eventually it's gonna go out. That's, that's considered normal, it's part of the hobby, it's part of any hobby, whether you're collecting, I don't know, buttons, stamps, Again, I'm an old guy in my head, but that's gonna be part of, of any hobby, right? You buy, you sell, you collect, your collection interests change and so forth. But if you're buying something on a Monday and selling it on Tuesday or Monday afternoon or some short time thereafter, so we're looking at the time connection, that's something that they're gonna be looking at. How often does that happen? So if that happens once or something like that, hey, that's one thing, but are you frequently purchasing something on a Monday or Tuesday and selling it the next week? Because again, 
the volume and the frequency of that occurrence is absolutely going to factor into the government's case against you of whether or not you are in the business of selling firearms and therefore require a license. Are you frequently purchasing the same types of firearms? So if you buy one or two G19 Glocks in a given day, week, or month, that's one thing. But if you buy 50 of them at one time or in one month, the government's going to use that as part of their case against you. And again, only the messenger here, folks. I can just hear the clacking. Someone's going to make a comment saying that I'm like in favor of all this. I can just feel it. Another factor that the government's probably going to be looking at is are you selling new firearms unopened and in factory original packaging? So again, somebody who's a hobbyist might be buying and selling used firearms, military surplus firearms, all that kind of stuff, fine. But in the government's case against an individual, and I've seen this before, again, former state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney here, when you see cases against individuals where the government's trying to say, you down the lens, you are a dealer, one of the common things is they're looking at, for instance, just stacks of boxes of, for instance, uh, Glocks, and nothing against Glocks, I'm a Glock guy myself, but you know, if you've got 20 boxes or 50 boxes of everything's new in box, all factory original, you bought them and you're selling them that way, the government's going to say that this is all signs that once more you're in the business because they would anticipate that a hobbyist would use the firearms, try the firearms, all that kind of stuff. After all, the government would argue if you are a hobbyist and if you shot it, decided you didn't like it, put it back, that's one thing. But why are you buying 20 of the same one, not shooting them and leaving them all in the box? That sounds a little bit more like a business. So the government would allege. And finally, what we're talking about is whether you are looking to make a profit. Now this gets tricky. Are you buying them at crazy low prices and then flipping them for a large profit? Because if you're doing that over and over and over again, or even just once or twice, I'm looking at you civilian marksmanship program guys who are out there and you're maxing out your M1 grands and everything else, then immediately flipping them onto gun broker like the same day that they come in. Uh, I'm shaking your head not because of I'm supporting necessarily regulation. I'm shaking my head because you're taking all my M1 grands. <laughs> that's why I'm shaking my head. So that's going to be something they're going to be looking at. I mean, believe it or not, it has become part of cases that I've participated in, whether or not uh, they're getting their firearms at high or low prices. Because after all, if somebody walks in to that gun store in town who's got the high prices and and I, you know what you know I'm what I'm talking about, right? There's always that one store in town that has really high prices and somehow they're still in business. My town has it too. So if you're buying them at sticker price, which is often at or above retail and then selling them for comparable prices, then even if you are in the business, that's it's a really bad business and you won't be in that business or any other business for long if you're buying and selling for about the same cost. But again, you have to be really careful, believe it or not, because if you do buy it, one or multiple farms at really low prices, and then you sell them at a high time, while I understand buy low, sell high, that's, you know, fundamentally what you're supposed to do with stocks and everything else, you are potentially backdooring a government's case against you for the fact that you bought that with the intention to sell it for profit, as opposed to you bought it with the intention to collect, and then later on, you decided to resell it, and it happened to be at a profit. There's a very important distinction between those two. And we'll see whether or not President Biden is going to be looking to blur those. But again, that's going to be something that you really have to pay attention to. And again, finally, it is important to note that courts have found that while you can buy and sell firearms with the principal objectives of livelihood and profit, even if your firearm related activities are not your primary business. In other words, you can still be engaged in the business of dealing in firearms with the principal objective of livelihood and profit if you have a full-time job. The reason why these words are so important is because that's part of the statute that I did not cover here, but it is linked in the description box below of whether or not somebody has become a firearms dealer is if they're engaged with the principal objective of livelihood and profit when they're they're doing, they're going about their sales. And I understand perfectly well that plain reading that statute would seem to understand, would seem to indicate that the principal objective of livelihood and profit to a lot of folks would be that, hey, this is your main job. The ATF has said that, no, this does not have to be your main job. So just be mindful of the fact, again, this isn't coming down to statutes. And no, I'm not asking you to like that. I'm not asking you to accept it. I'm just the messenger telling you how to not wind up in prison. So do as you will, but that's what it is. But what does the ATF have to say about all this? Because you know that they have thrown in their two cents. And indeed, they have. Linked in the description box below, they have included a PDF outline, which rest assured may become rapidly outdated with gun control initiative, but 
as of 2023, early 2023, this is all accurate right now. In addition to those court factors that they've pointed out in that guideline, as well as I've found elsewhere and I'm familiar with elsewhere, they also put in a bunch of different FAQ scenarios. That I just wanna quickly walk through because it does illustrate and show kind of some of the do's and don'ts of when do you cross that, I was about to say imaginary line, but um, <laughs> that line, the statutory line of when do you become a firearms dealer. This is number one from the ATF. Bob inherits a collection of firearms from his grandfather. He would rather have cash than the firearms, so he posts them all online for sale. He makes no purchases, but over the course of the next year, he sells all the firearms that he inherited in a series of different transactions. The ATF has said that if you are in a situation like Bob, so you've inherited a bunch of firearms, you're selling a bunch of firearms, you're not buying anything back, you're just selling, then you do not need to get a license because he's liquidating a personal collection. So this is an example where, again, steering back up to that court criteria. We're talking about the ongoing frequency and repetitive nature of sales. This is an exception because we're looking at firearms liquidation, basically. Also, we see nothing coming in. Scenario number two, Joe recently lost his job and to finance his living expenses, he has been buying firearms from friends and reselling them through an internet site. He has successfully sold a few firearms this way and has several more listed for sale at any point in time. So what we're seeing here is the ATF has illustrated the fact that Joe needs money and he's presumably engaging in the process of buying and reselling firearms for profit. This means that he's doing this for his livelihood, which as a reminder, according to the clarifications, you do not have to be doing that on a full-time basis. You can be doing this on a part-time basis. So accordingly, the ATF decided that Joe must be licensed because he is repetitively buying and selling firearms with the primary objective of profit. Scenario number three, Sharon, because ladies can get in on this too, travels to flea markets the first Saturday of every month, buying undervalued goods, including firearms. The last Saturday of every month, Sharon rents a booth at the flea market and sells her items at market value for profit. She hopes to make enough money from these sales to finance a trip to Italy next year. So what do you guys think? Is Sharon committing a felony? Well, right there is the fact that she's buying them at undervalued and then reselling them at market value. So this is once more something I said before, but it just really bears repeating that beware reselling firearms if you get a really good deal on them. No, I'm not suggesting that's fair. I am suggesting that that's a way to stay out of handcuffs though. And I'm not saying that you have to forever hang on to things you get good deals on. I'm not saying that. But we're talking about in the Sharon example though, is we're talking about the fact that she's immediately redoing this within the space of a month, so a couple week gap, and she's doing this for the express purpose of doing this for profit. So accordingly and predictably, the ATF decided that Sharon must get a license because she is repetitively buying and selling firearms with the primary objective of profit. Next scenario, David enjoys hunting and has a large variety of hunting rifles. He likes to have the newest models with the most current features. To pay for his new rifles a few times a year, David sells his older weapons to fellow hunters for profit. All right, so this one's gonna be a little bit more nuanced because what we have here is the fact that David is selling these rifles for a profit. And I'm not really sure what kind of rifles David's selling for profit if they're hunting rifles, because if you're like me, generally speaking, when you see a Remington 700, Winchester Model 70, Henry repeating arms, whatever it is, kind of more stereotypical hunting rifles, they tend to go down in value after you buy them rather than up. So maybe David's friends are suckers. I don't know. Maybe David's not being a very good friend of them, but we'll set those issues aside for a moment here and just focus on the fact that, look, apparently he did sell it for profit. Great. I think the big thing that the ATF's gonna be looking at with this before I get to their answer is the fact that when he's purchasing the rifles, the hunting rifles, he's not doing it for the express purpose of reselling it for profit. So I think that the ATF will say that he's going to be fine because he's not purchasing with the intent of resale for profit. He's purchasing for the intent of using, for hunting, for enjoying, for recreating. And then down the line, he'll resell things to basically fund his hobby. Let's look at the ATF answer. And indeed, David does not need to get a license because he is engaging in occasional sales for the enhancement of his personal collection. So yes, you can incidentally engage in the sale of firearms for profit. And again, incidentally, and I won't bore you in, in scholastic medieval philosophy of when something is accidental to, to the effect and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to go into uh, Thomas Aquinas' theology, 
let me know in the in the comment box below. We'll see all one of you jump for that. The point here is that David is is incidentally making um, profit on this. He's again, he's not doing it with the intent of purchasing a firearm to resell for profit. He's simply selling and he's incidentally making profit and he's doing so for the purpose of basically reinvesting his collection and moves collection forward. Next example, Lynn regularly travels to gun shows around her state, rents space and sells firearms under the banner stating, quote, liquidating personal collection, end quote. Most of the firearms Lynn offers for sale, she purchased from a licensed dealer in the prior weeks. Lynn is retired and hopes to supplement her income with the money she makes on the sales, although she has yet to turn a profit. Right. So by now, if you've been playing along, you're probably getting the fact of what the ATF's going to be looking for. They're going to be looking at the fact of, look, she's buying, she's selling, she's doing this repetitively, and she's doing this for the purpose of profit. Yes, she has the... Uh, the banner liquidating personal collection, that's all good and fine, but at the end of the day, that's not gonna save her in court if the ATF is taking a close look at this. So don't think that something like that's gonna fool people. If they do something amounting to any kind of due diligence investigation, they're going to figure that out. Let's take a look at the ATF answer. Lynn must get a license because she is repetitively buying and selling firearms with the primary objective of profit. So there you go. Next example. Scott has been collecting high-end firearms for years. In the six months before his son is about to enter college, Scott sells most of his collection in a series of transactions at gun shows on the internet and to family and friends to provide funds to pay for his son's college expenses. So we have Scott here who has been purchasing purchasing firearms and he's been doing it out of a collector interest. He's not been doing this out of a repetitive buy and resell, nor has he been doing it from the perspective of I'm going to purchase with the intent of flipping this for profit. So I suspect that the ATF is going to say that this is going to be good to go. What is their answer? They say that Scott does not need to be licensed because he is liquidating part of his personal collection. Next one, Debbie has three handguns at home and decides that she no longer wants two of them. She posts an advertisement on the local newspaper and sells the two handguns to a local collector. Well, this one seems awfully straightforward. She has three. She decides to sell two. She's liquidating part of her collection. She's not engaging in repetitive sales. She did not purchase them for the purposes of immediate resale and profit and all that kind of stuff. ATF answer is Debbie does not need a license because she is not engaging in the repetitive purchase and resale of firearms as the regular course of trade or business. All right, here's a longer example. Jessica enjoys shooting sports and is frequently going to shooting ranges and hunting clubs. To make some extra money, uh-oh, that's the kiss of death words, right? She buys firearms from a dealer who is willing to give her a discount and resells them for profit to acquaintances from the shooting ranges and hunting clubs. She's done this a few times a month for the last several months and has been spreading the word that she has the source for other firearms. She passes out business cards with her name, phone number, and email. So do you remember the categories we're talking about? We have repetitive, buying and selling, flipping, and it seems like she's also basically displaying herself as being a business by saying, look, I can get firearms, let me know what you want. Not to mention the fact we've got business cards and all that kind of stuff. And the ATF answer is predictably that Jessica must get a license because she is repetitively buying and selling firearms with the primary objective of profit. All right, guys, last ATF example. Doug regularly attends gun shows and rents a table to display firearms for sale. He gets firearms from a variety of sources, carefully logs each purchase into a book, and uses the purchase price to set a sales price that will realize him a net profit. Uh-oh. Doug accepts credit cards payments and typically sells multiple firearms at each of the gun shows he attends each year. He makes a substantial amount of money annually and uses his money to live on. Well, hopefully by now, if you've been playing along, you can see that this is kind of a no-brainer. Generally speaking, people who are hobbyists are not taking credit card purchases, they're not structurally going to gun shows, and they're not repetitively engaged in the process of buying and selling firearms, and he's making sure he's doing so for profit, and he's doing so in a way that makes it look like he's a business because he's got careful logs and all that kind of stuff. So guys, hopefully you understand that I'm not telling you this because I like like this and I love this and I support everything. I'm telling you this to bring you the information to keep you on the right side of the law. What you decide to do with this information from here on out is of course, as always, absolutely up to you. I also appreciate this video was not super short, but I also didn't even go into tons of case law and everything else. So if you wanna see future videos going into the specific cases, we're looking at fingerprint scenarios where courts have called ball or strike dealer or no dealer, let me know in the comment field below. Also, let me know if you liked this video and if you support the Second Amendment by clicking like. Also, of course, subscribe to the channel channel. And as always, I will see you in the comment field and in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.